No baby born in the post-war years could have had a clearer destiny marked for them than Prince Charles Philip Arthur George, heir to the British throne. Childhood play was a diversion from an austere upbringing designed to produce an ideal king. His schooling and wider education were part of a programme leading to the most important event in his youth, his investiture as the 21st English Prince of Wales. When you marry, Conscious of his obligations to crown and country, Charles knew he had to find the perfect wife. With his wedding to Lady Diana Spencer and the births of their sons William and Harry, the monarchy's future seemed secure. But the fairy tale marriage fell apart. A year after their divorce, Diana died tragically in a car crash in Paris. Nothing in Charles's life had prepared him for the task of raising his sons alone after the dreadful loss of their mother. The high hopes of Charles's boyhood have descended to the deepest tragedy. The dreams of his youth have long gone. He still campaigns for his dearly held beliefs in the environment, but his own life has become almost a Shakespearean tragedy. A few months after Diana died, he visited Bhutan, one of the world's most desolate regions. It was an opportunity for meditation, soul-searching, and the evaluation of a life that had once promised so much and now held an uncertain future. In Bhutan, as in other places, he found solace in breathtaking scenery, which he tried to capture in his watercolor paintings. Art provided a release from the frustrations of a life spent in waiting to become king. As Charles sketched the Himalayan skyline, he may have contemplated the failures and the difficulties of his adult life. Now 50, Charles is twice the age of his mother when she came to the throne in 1952. He would feel that he's had a wasted life. What has he done with these 50 years as a king in waiting? It's a horrendous job, sitting there waiting for your mother to die, something that he both dreads and in a way looks forward to. Diana's glamour had eclipsed Charles and his family. She made him feel that his efforts to be a popular Prince of Wales went unrecognised. Their personal friction grew into a marital war which damaged Charles's image as heir to the throne. He is still trying to restore his lost popularity. In a way, he's still competing with Diana's shadow. She still overshadows all the royal family. She's still more popular, dead than any of them alive are. But nevertheless, she has left the way clear now for him to show what sort of man he is. And he's a very well-meaning, dutiful, dedicated person. And most of the time he comes across as very sincere, very genuine. He's got that beautiful, chivalrous, old world air about him, very gallant. He, he's just absolutely charming. Diana's death as a former member of the royal family tested protocol. There were disagreements over her status. Charles behaved more like a widower than a divorced husband. He ensured that Diana was accorded the respect she had sometimes been denied in life. He was anxious to help his boys face the public before their Charles, mother's funeral. Charles. Thank you so much. Thank you. Harry. William. William. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. William and Harry behaved with remarkable dignity, taking strength from the sympathy of ordinary people who mourned their mother. But it was their father's love and support that really carried them through their ordeal during those unforgettable scenes before and during Diana's funeral. Oceans of flowers were left at the royal palaces as tributes to Diana. Charles showed his sons that life had to go on. A few weeks after Diana's death, he made a visit to South Africa. He received a rapturous welcome, the sort that he had once enjoyed as a single man. 
Savoring his newfound appeal, he entered into the spirit of the occasion. The burden of rivalry with Diana had been tragically lifted. Charles felt free to be himself. Everyone's noted how his own behaviour seems to have transformed since Diana's death, how much more outgoing, how much more relaxed he's been. I think he always found himself uh, playing second fiddle to her. He always found himself overshadowed by her. Whatever card he played, she seemed to trump. And I think he must desperately have hoped that divorce would somehow put an end under this awful story. Of course, it didn't. It didn't. Only her death did. There's no doubt since Diana's death that it has looked as if a huge burden has been lifted from Charles's shoulders. And in many ways, other members of the royal family as well. We've seen what I call the Dianification of the royal family on the Queen's golden wedding anniversary. There she was, walk about in Whitehall, holding one of these heart-shaped silver balloons. The Queen would never have done that in the pre-Diana era. And Charles, you can't say he's glad she's dead, but clearly it's made his life a great deal easier. Prince Harry, just 13, accompanied his father to South Africa. The spectacular displays of tribal dancing proved a tonic for the young boy. It was a way of going forward after his mother's death. It was part of the process of coming to terms with his terrible loss, and it was an experience to share with his father. I think one of the, the major successes of the South African tour as a way it's shown um, how the Prince of Wales is coping um, in the initial stages of being a single parent. And indeed, he, uh, uh, the royal family are, are conditioned not to show emotion in public, but he put his arm around the boy on several occasions. He stopped short of, of giving him a, a fatherly hug, but at least it was a very friendly pat. And he's not a normally tactile person, Prince of Wales isn't, and I think Harry responded in kind, because he was used to it from his late mother, of course. Drinking the local brew reinforced the bond between Charles and his hosts, with the added bonus of giving Harry something he could tell his friends about. For Harry, Charles encouraged an atmosphere of warmth and laughter. Harry constantly looked to his father all the time for guidance, or like, what are we going to do next? Where are we going? And he kept looking at his father and laughing with his father and um, they're having a really good time together. And one day, one of the best days, when we went to a Zulu village where there were lots of bare-breasted dancing girls and poor little Harry didn't know where to look, kept sort of chatting to his father, sort of to say, what do I do now? It was wonderful to see the, the interaction between them. William and Harry have many happy memories of the love of both their parents. Charles was a devoted father and took a delight in seeing his sons grow from infants to schoolboys. Before their kindergarten years, Charles had enjoyed feeding and bathing the boys. Even Diana once admitted, Charles loved the nursery life. He made a great effort, I think, to be um, a hands-on, tactile parent to William and Harry when they were very young. I understand that he actually took a hand in changing nappies and uh, seeing them, uh, helping to bath them, things that no other member of the royal family had ever done prior to this. Charles is a very different parent to his children than, uh, than his, his parents had to be to him. You must remember um, that they, he was born in 1948 and just six years later, in 1952, his mother became also his queen and the, um, the demands of a constitutional monarchy um, really superseded those of being a, a devoted parent. The Queen, I think, is a devoted parent, but at the same time, she puts duty before everything, including her own personal happiness. Charles's own childhood was very formal. The family moved with the seasons around the royal estate, with Charles dutifully attending various annual events, such as the Braemar Games in Scotland. Summers were spent at Balmoral. Little had changed at the Queen's Scottish Highland home since Queen Victoria's days. Balmoral was conveniently close to Gordonston, the character-building school where Charles's father, Prince Philip, had been a pupil in the 1930s. 
Philip decided that Gordonston would develop Charles's potential and the 13-year-old prince became a boarder there. Well, Charles had an absolutely miserable time at Gordonston, although he, his father, in whose footsteps he followed, loved it. And he was horribly bullied because he was different and because he was vulnerable. And these are two things that schoolboys being very cruel pick on. And people used to follow him behind, around, taunting him. And if um, any boy tried to be nice to him, they would, you know, accuse him of sucking up. So he had a thoroughly miserable time. The Spartan dormitories and harsh regime did not suit Charles's sensitive personality. A good education didn't compensate for the bullying he received. It did sow into him this spirit of defeatism and, and proneness to depression that he had, because he was really miserable at Gordonston. But he certainly, uh, his contemporaries testify that he was singled out for pretty vicious bullying at a, at a pretty vicious school, actually. Utterly miserable there. And it may have sown in him certain self-doubt and uh, other qualities that we still see with him at 50. Philip took an active role in his son's upbringing. He made inevitable comparison with Charles's sister, Princess Anne, who was younger but made of sterner stuff than her gentle-natured brother. Charles and Anne were prepared for a life in the public eye. Anne's tougher qualities made her Philip's favorite. Philip's always been a very tyrannical and demanding father. His way of compensating for his own public role as number two to his wife, which Philip's never been comfortable with, uh, was to be head of the family. And it's often been said, and it's absolutely true, that Princess Anne was his favorite son, his only daughter, because she, in Philip's eyes, has showed a lot more strength of character than any of his sons. And particularly in childhood, Charles could be reduced to tears by Philip driving him on, thinking he was a bit of a wimp, that Anne was the tougher one, and that's what he wanted his son to be. And that's remained true in adulthood. Charles wanted to please his father with his sporting achievements. He tried to compete with Philip's skills at polo. It was a hard game with physical dangers, but the Queen approved. Polo involved her own great love of horses. And winning trophies made Charles feel triumphant. In competition with his father, regular performances on the polo field gave Charles a new image and an unexpected nickname, Action Man. The Prince of Wales always felt he had to prove himself. I think that's where the whole action man thing, I mean, I, I honestly feel that he's more of a cultured man than an action man, but he's quite capable of doing some quite action man type things, you know. And uh, I think probably he felt that his father would have approved if he, all that strength through joy. It's a good old Gordonston cold shower nonsense. I didn't really go for it. But I think it's rather nice that the Prince of Wales can play the cello, he can play a game of polo, he can do various things, you know. He's, he's more of a Renaissance man, in my opinion, than his father. Charles saw his contemporaries, such as his relative Lord Rumsey, marrying and settling down. He wanted to please the Queen and Philip by making a good choice himself. Now turned 30, he knew the pressure was on. And of course, Charles famously blamed Philip for pushing him into marriage with Diana when he wasn't entirely sure, but he was in his 30s and time was running out. Uh, so it's a very tense relationship and uh, I think in many ways uh, some things that have been discussed recently like Charles leading reforms of the monarchy uh, against Philip's opposition, it's payback time for Charles. This is when he can get his own back on his dad. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. With his spectacular investiture at Carnarvon Castle in 1969, Charles was raised high by public expectation. He knew even then that his future wife would have a demanding role. You've got to remember that when you marry, in my position, you're going to marry somebody who perhaps one day is going to become queen. And you've got to choose somebody very carefully, I think. 
who, who could fulfill this particular role. Because people like you, perhaps, would expect quite a lot from somebody like that. And it's got to be somebody pretty special. Alongside her royal counterparts, his chosen wife came to join a notably exclusive family with its unusual habits, pastimes and rituals. Annual attendance at the Braemar Games was expected. Like the Queen and Queen Mother, Charles loved the ceremony and traditions of the event. But for a modern bride, desperately trying to share her in-laws' tastes, it was a trial. Diana always felt an outsider. Charles's love of polo had introduced him to a social set beyond the confines of Gordonstone and Cambridge, from which he had graduated in 1970, a year after his investiture. Polo was played by dashing young officers and watched by attractive girls. The brewery heiress Sabrina Guinness was one of the many single girls openly linked with Charles. Blonde film star Susan George briefly held his affections, as did the Duke of Wellington's daughter, Lady Jane Wellesley. The one we did think at that time had a chance of marrying Charles was Davina Sheffield, who was a very pretty, delightful girl. Um, everybody thought that uh, she was very much in love with Charles and that he was with her. I know that Charles's valet, Stephen Barry, said that Davina was the one girl that he seemed not to be able to let go of when he kept in touch with her for a very long time afterwards. So obviously there was a great deal of affection there. The Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977 focused attention on the royal family, including Charles, the unmarried heir to a queen who had reigned for 25 years. I remember, I, it was some time ago, and I was my 21st birthday, I think. I um, had a dance at, at Buckingham Palace, and there was a splendid rumour the next day that I was about to get engaged to some splendid lady. <laughs> and uh, I went home to Norfolk and a uh, wonderful old boy. <laughs> <laughs> when we were out pottering about, who was the fish and game merchant from King's Lynn. And he came up to me and he, he looked at me for a long time and he said, Master, as he always called him Master, he said, you make sure you look at their mothers first, he said. <laughs> Laughing off his bachelor status was typical of Charles. He enjoyed clowning around in public, quite unlike his regal older relatives. This was the man who sent his favorite horse a Christmas card and enjoyed fooling around for the cameras, something Diana could occasionally share with her husband. Humor was an escape valve for an otherwise tense young man facing a lifetime of dutiful obligations. If anybody ever envied the Prince of Wales with his limousines and, and private trains and private planes, you wouldn't if you would hear him, what he said to us one day. He said, you can't imagine how awful it is to have your whole life mapped out for you. Because he was mentioning that any time he wanted to, we could go off to the movies at night and see something or have a bit of fun. He couldn't. His life's preordained. He said, I know where I'm going to be next week, next month, next year. He said, you just imagine what that's like. Well, it's a pretty horrendous thought. I mean, I don't think many of us could put up with it. It is, it is that he's trapped. He's trapped by birth. However, in the 1970s, being a bachelor Prince of Wales had undisputed advantages. Unlimited female attention for one. No wonder Charles needed pressure to give up his freedom and take on the restrictions and responsibilities of marriage. Service in the Royal Navy completed Charles's formal education. The young officer had a secret known to very few. He had fallen in love. From the moment he met Camilla Shand in 1972, she would dominate his life. Charles is very much a ditherer. Um, right back, crucially, to his choice of a bride. He was described as being like Hamlet, the indecisive prince. He could have married Camilla when he first met her in the early 70s. He was in the Navy, and he not unreasonably thought he was about to go off around the world for the best part of a year, that it was unfair to ask anybody to wait for him at this time. And he was horrified when he got a letter 
uh, way out in the Caribbean somewhere that she was going to marry Andrew Parker Bowles and he'd missed his chance. Charles regrets that moment of being indecisive and not proposing marriage to her and will regret it for the rest of his days. The structured and disciplined routine of naval life filled Charles's days and gave him the chance to gain promotion and earn respect through his own efforts. Well, thank you all once again for, for having me here. I've enjoyed it enormously and I hope you all have a, a very happy Christmas indeed. Charles used Broadlands, home of his great uncle Lord Mountbatten, as a weekend retreat to entertain a host of eligible girlfriends. One of the most beautiful was Anna Wallace. But Anna Wallace had the class, the background, the spirit uh, that, that it took, I thought, to be a, a proper partner for a Prince of Wales. But she didn't like the way he treated her and she wasn't going to put up with it and she let him know about it. And at a ball, when he spent most of the night dancing with Camilla Parker Bowles and not her, she just flounced out and said, you know, nobody treats me like that, not even the Prince of Wales. That's, that at least was in the clear. It wasn't conscious nepotism. Mountbatten was Charles's mentor. Charles confided his secrets to the elderly Earl and asked his advice on matters close to the heart. <laughs> They called each other Henri Grandfather and Henri Grandson because, of course, his grandfather, the king, had died when he was only three or four. Mountbatten was a worldly wise man who gave Charles very direct advice, particularly about women, and made his home broadlands available to the prince. He told him he should sow some wild oats. And uh, various girlfriends of the prince's, including Camilla Parker Bowles, were entertained at broadlands while Mountbatten looked the other way. But his real ambition was that Charles, after he'd sown those wild oats, should marry his own granddaughter, Amanda Natchbull. Mountbatten's hopes died with him. He was assassinated by the IRA in Ireland in 1979. It was a devastating blow for Charles, who bravely read the funeral lesson. They are carried up to the heaven and down again to the deep. Their soul melteth away because of the trouble. Mountbatten's murder by the IRA so in 1979 was a huge trouble. blow to Charles. It left an enormous void in his life. He's always had this yearning for older, wiser figures as mentors, from Lord Butler at Cambridge to Van der Post. Uh, I think it Charles, left Charles adrift for a while. It was after that that he proposed to Amanda Natchbull, perhaps to try and retain the link with his grandfather at a time when he was said to be trying to contact Mountbatten via Ouija boards and spiritualists, so big was the hole in his life. 19-year-old Lady Diana Spencer had watched Lord Mountbatten's funeral on television. The first time he really sat up and took any notice of Diana was on a hay bale on a Sussex farm in 1980 when she found herself sitting next to him and she said, oh, you poor man, you looked so sad at Lord Mountbatten's funeral, you need somebody to look after you properly. And he was still vulnerable enough to be very touched by this and did a sort of double take and thought, gosh, maybe there's more to this little girl than I'd noticed. So in a funny way, Mountbatten's death led him to Diana. Mountbatten would very much have approved of, of Diana Spencer as a bride for Prince Charles. She was aristocratic, she was beautiful, uh, she was apparently a virgin, she was everything that he had always advised Prince Charles to look for in a wife. When his close friend Nicholas Soames married, Charles took his fiancée to the wedding. But Diana had no idea of the complex secrets of Charles's private life, and even in close social proximity, Camilla's husband gave nothing away. By then, Prince Charles had been having a love affair with Camilla Parker Bowles for almost 10 years through her marriage to Andrew. I think what characterized the whole thing before, during and after Charles's marriage to Diana was that Andrew Parker Bowles was an old fashioned enough Englishman to regard it as his public duty to allow the Prince of Wales to exercise what used to be called droit de seigneur over his wife. Um, many people find this hard to understand, but Parker Bowles has been a very loyal courtier, but he was prepared to look the other way while the Prince of Wales had an affair with his wife and really didn't 
capitulate until Charles admitted adultery in 1994 in his television interview and that was the last straw for Parker Bowles, public humiliation. He'd put up with private humiliation but public humiliation, that was when he went for a divorce. Charles had hidden his affair with Camilla, the mother of two young children, from his fiancée but Diana had grown suspicious. She was just 20 and days away from her own wedding. The constant strain of media attention and her secret fears over Camilla caused her to break down at a polo match. She was led away and comforted by Lord Romsey and by Charles, but it was a sign that all was not well. We have to remember that Charles did give up Camilla when he got married. However, we, and he remained in love with her, but he did actually physically give her up. And I think that the thought that he might still be in love with her was very much swept under the carpet by the royal family who were delighted by the marriage. Let's not um, say anything to the contrary. They were thrilled. They thought it was very suitable. The Queen and, and, and the Duke of Edinburgh were absolutely delighted with it. On his honeymoon, Charles apparently read five volumes by his friend, the elderly philosopher Lawrence van der Post. He insisted on reading these aboard the royal yacht Britannia, much to Diana's dismay. While the public thought that the golden couple were enjoying a luxurious cruise, seeds of marital discord were being sown. I think poor Diana realized as early as the honeymoon that there might be enormous trouble making this marriage work. She'd had her suspicions already in the months of the engagement about Camilla Parker Bowles, who was always around, who always seemed to know what was going on before Diana did. And when they went on honeymoon aboard Britannia, Charles tended to spend all day reading van der, Lawrence van der Post books. And of course, every evening they had dinner with all the officers in the officers' mess. So it wasn't exactly a touchy-feely being alone together honeymoon like most people have. After their Mediterranean cruise, the Prince and Princess of Wales flew to Scotland to join the other royals at Balmoral. The newlyweds posed happily for the cameras. But it was a deceptive performance. Diana was already ill, suffering from the eating disorder bulimia nervosa and from depression she was obsessed by thoughts of Camilla. The irony was when she began to show signs of bulimia and signs of depression, as the honeymoon continued that autumn at Balmoral, Charles brought up to talk to her, of all people, Lawrence van der Post, his elderly mentor, who he thought might try and understand better than he could what was wrong with this young girl. And this was the last man in the world she wanted to talk to because he'd haunted her honeymoon in the shape of his books. She said he spent more time with Van der Post than he did with me on our honeymoon. Diana's problems were no obstacle to royal tours. In 1983, the couple was sent on an official visit to Australia and New Zealand. Diana later said, by the end of it, I was a different person. I realized the sense of duty, the level of intensity of interest, and the demanding role I now found myself in. Six weeks on the road, it was cruel and inhuman to do that to the girl. I saw how he guided her, how he kept patting her hand, encouraging her, but she shouldn't have been there for six weeks. They shouldn't have allowed it. She'd had a baby nine months earlier. I mean, she had to go through a tremendous adjustment from being a kindergarten helper to being the famous royal fiancé, bride of the century, mother of the year, all in a period of 12 months. And nobody seemed to take that into consideration. They just said, right, well, we'll shove Diana and Charles out on the Royal Road now because they're terrific uh, publicity for Britain. And they did it. And of course, no wonder the girl got to bulimia. She, she tried so hard to be the perfect princess and she didn't really know what to do. Charles seemed proud of his wife. Ladies and gentlemen, the last time I was here was two years ago uh, in 1981 shortly before uh, we were married. And uh, at that time, everybody was saying, good luck and I hope everything goes well and how lucky you are to be engaged to such a lovely lady. And my goodness, 
I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, many messages. It's amazing what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> Two years later, the couple made a successful tour of Italy. They were now an experienced partnership. On the surface, all seemed as calm as their gondola ride in Venice. But behind the visits to beautiful Italian cities, there were ominous signs. Charles was forging ahead with his interests in art and architecture, subjects that the princess found boring. He had grown to love painting. He was proud of his results and he strove to improve his techniques. But it was a hobby he preferred to practice alone. While her husband grew more absorbed, Diana was often left to kick her heels. This was not the romantic marriage she had hoped for. On a cruise aboard the Britannia after the official tour, the marriage began to come adrift. Charles felt he had done all he could to help Diana cope with her royal life. He settled down with Diana and he really did devote himself to making her happy. Now this was a very difficult job as we all know because she found it so, so awful to cope with the pressure she was under from from transforming herself from a nobody into the world's most famous cover girl virtually overnight. So they had a lot of difficulties. So he, he devoted himself to helping her, but he was just a man. He's not Superman and he, he made mistakes. He didn't understand the problems that she had and a lot of it turned him off and his, his sympathies were finally exhausted. But, you know, he did try. He did get her to a psychiatrist and I think he did as much as any man could have been expected to do, but she was a very difficult woman to live with. The couple soldiered on, but by the summer of 1986, the marriage had privately broken down. On holiday in Mallorca with the Spanish royal family, Charles and Diana played the happy couple. In fact, Diana hated the attention Charles received from King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia. Diana suffered serious bouts of bulimia. After a few days, Charles returned home alone. Reunited with Camilla Parker Bowles, he headed straight for the sanctuary of his beloved Balmoral. Well, there are many royal homes, but of all of them, uh, Charles has always said that Balmoral is his favorite from childhood through adulthood. During the decline of his marriage to Diana, it was to Balmoral that he always disappeared and there was this pattern where the first time the public really realized something was wrong was when Charles was always at Balmoral and Diana wasn't. It's always the place where he goes to think and retreat and recover his spiritual energies and it's always meant a great deal more to him than any other home. Hard games of polo with its rough physical challenges helped Charles cope with his inner tensions. But sometimes the frustrations showed. Polo, like hunting, provided an ideal cover for continued contact with Camilla Parker Bowles. I think nearly every male member of the royal family, as far back as anyone can remember, can remember. Um, if they've decided to have extramarital relationships, um, they nearly always, invariably, uh, choose a married woman to have a liaison with. Uh, the married woman, I suppose, always has a reason to go home to her husband, and she's not going to put the bite on that particular member of the royal family. Camilla Parker Bowles would be at Windsor quite a lot. I remember her spending quite a lot of time there, but not so, you know, there was, there was never any impre impression that you know, once the marriage had really got underway, that, that Camilla was pushing her nose in or, or, or sort of determined to be there. But, I mean, clearly, if her husband was playing, and he played for quite a long time, that uh, Andrew Parker Wells and the Prince of Wales would have played on the same teams. 
Charles's friends fell under Diana's suspicion. Even the Palmer Tompkinsons, whose daughters Santa and Tara were regulars on the social scene. Their mother Patty grew close to Camilla, and the family became part of Charles's exclusive Highgrove set. The Palmer Tompkinsons are very long-standing friends, starting on the ski slopes where the annual trip to Closters is actually spent in their chalet, but they become very close members of the intimate circle throughout the decline of the marriage, etc., in England as well as there. They particularly bonded during the avalanche that very nearly killed Charles, killed his friend Major Hugh Lindsay, and very nearly killed Mrs. Palmer Tompkinson, who was swept over the precipice with Major Lindsay and was very lucky to survive with multiple injuries. I think that bonded them all together. And it was interesting thereafter that Charles and the Palmer Tompkinsons decided they must keep going back to Closters year after year to cauterize this memory. But the Palmer Tompkinsons and their two sprightly daughters who are famous what are called it girls on the circuit these days um, are still to be seen on the ski slopes with Charles and Tara Palmer Tompkinson uh, is not ashamed of making use of this royal connection to advertise various designer ski gear and so on. That's the kind of girl she is. They're very close friends who've seen Charles through many a dark hour. <laughs> Charles and Diana both took an active role in their son's upbringing, training them for a life of public appearances. I've always believed that he was an excellent father. Um, you know, I think that um, when Diana fed them with junk food and lots of fun, I thought that Charles was preferred to feed their minds and was taken to the Royal Shakespeare Company, things like that. Diana often complained about Charles's frequent absences and his distance from the family. She even suggested that his occasional outings with his sons were just for show. But was this fair? It's certainly true that since her death, he's become a model father, cancelling public engagements to spend time with them or postponing them, which he'd never done before. And I think the pattern is that duty came before domestic priorities while Diana was alive. And it took Diana's death for him to realise that Maybe the children should come first. But there's no doubt that his children love him and he loves them. And I think a lot of the criticism of him being a distant father is rather cruel and unfair. Charles's reckless pursuit of dangerous sports caused several injuries. In 1990, he broke his arm after a particularly nasty fall at polo. The break was painful and refused to heal. It was more serious than at first suspected Charles reluctantly gave in to medical advice and had further surgery. Diana took her grimacing husband home from hospital. He was still in pain and needed a period of recuperation. How are you, sir? <laughs> now married in name only, they staged a show of togetherness out of duty. The public didn't know that Camilla had visited him in hospital. Keeping up appearances, Charles and Diana returned to Highgrove, their country home. Diana soon left, and Camilla came over from her nearby home, Middlewick House, to provide Charles with tender, loving care. Camilla had become mistress of Highgrove. Highgrove was his HQ near the Parker Bowleses, near Camilla. And it had the atmosphere of Camilla to it before they even got married. And throughout their marriage, close friends of Charles would be the Highgrove set. And there were several times at the various stages of deterioration when Diana tried to break up this Highgrove set. Diana would leave on a Sunday afternoon to take the children back to London to go to school, and Charles would be straight out to the Parker Bowleses, or Camilla would come straight over as soon as Diana had gone. And of course, famously, Diana, when she arrived, would always go into Charles's study and press the redial button on his phone, and it would go straight through to Camilla's number. So there, she always felt very uncomfortable, very spooked, not at home at all. It was his house, not hers. In February 1992, Charles and Diana made an official visit to India, 
Rumors about their relationship were rife. Diana had already secretly betrayed her husband to an author who would soon expose their sham marriage and Charles' affair with Camilla. Diana had discovered that Charles's private foreign trips were not all that they seemed. She had learned that her husband had other reasons for making visits to archaeological sites and for his now familiar painting tours. He was secretly meeting Camilla abroad. In 1989, they had been photographed together during a trip to Turkey. When the full story finally became public knowledge in 1992, the press photographed Camilla and her friend Patty Palmer Tomkinson openly mingling in the royal enclosure at a polo match. I think it's very difficult to speculate in terms of the relationship between Charles and Camilla. It's quite clear that Charles and Camilla have been extraordinarily close for a very long period of time. That there was a, a deep level of sexual passion, at least from him to her, if not necessarily from her to him. It's clear also that she's been able to provide him with a level of emotional support, of, of maturity, of somebody who shares attitude, sense of humour, interests, country pursuits, all of those sorts of things. <laughs> Charles had betrayed Diana. Within months, they separated and finally divorced in 1996. It was the end of an extraordinary partnership. Weeks before she died, Diana said, we could have been the best team in the world, but it was not to be. There were a few more joint appearances, always with their sons. Taking William to see his new school, Eton or taking part in ceremonies of wartime remembrance united the Wales family for a brief few hours, a poignant reminder of what might have been. Their last time in public was for William's confirmation in March 1997. Just five months later, Diana died in Paris. Charles performed his saddest duty in bringing home his former wife's body to a country in mourning. With Charles's wishes, Diana was treated as a royal princess. William and Harry saw that their mother was paid every possible honor on her final journey. Charles accompanied his sons to Diana's private burial at Althrop, her family home. He had responded to her tragic loss with unexpected dignity. I think Charles's behaviour during the week of the f following her death was absolutely impeccable. Uh, it was also that of a man who was genuinely appalled by what had happened clearly overcome by the deepest mixed feelings. I, because I think one of the things that has been very frequently misrepresented is the relationship between Charles and Diana. It wasn't a loveless marriage. If you look at the two of them, those shots at the very beginning of the marriage, these are people between whom there is some very, very close tie. I think Charles was half in love, half not in love. Diana thought she was in love, but she was probably at least as much in love with the idea of being a princess as, as in love with Prince Charles. A few weeks after the heartbreak of Diana's death, Charles and Harry attended a pop concert in South Africa. 13-year-old Harry was thrilled to meet the Spice Girls. He thinks it's contemptible to exploit your children for your own benefit, that he wouldn't do that, he wouldn't put the children through that. And I, I admired that, but didn't get him anywhere, got him nowhere. So, you know, you can be noble about these things, but Diana was better at at manipulating the media and her own public image. And she got her message across, and he got the, only the message that he was a, a, a lousy father. 
the evening was the tonic for both father and son. I said to him on the plane, I said, I think you're awfully brave meeting the Spice Girls again. And he went, oh, God, he said. He said, you know, I've got to meet them a third time in London. He obviously was not relishing the idea of meeting them because, you know, they'd plastered him with kisses the first time. And he was a bit worried about that, looking undignified. But when he did meet them, and I was there watching, he really joined into the spirit of the occasion. It was good fun. I mean, when and Nelson Mandela said it was the greatest moment of his life, the prince was much cleverer than that. And he said, no, this is the second greatest moment of my life. It's the second greatest moment. <laughs> and when we asked him what was the, the first greatest moment, he said, well, the first time I met them, of course. There we are. Well, and the first time I met them. Oh, this yeah. was the old Charles, the Charles that we knew many years ago, reappearing. The spin doctors are already representing him as the caring, compassionate prince that he was thought of before Diana ever came on the scene in his 20s. It was just that she did it so much better than him. She genuinely was the caring, compassionate princess that he ap appeared an old fuddy-duddy stick in the mud interested in things like architecture and the environment, which are not really major issues in people's everyday lives, while she campaigned about AIDS and cancer and battered wives and homeless people and sick children, which are issues in people's everyday lives. Now you see Charles touching AIDS patients and himself, to some extent, becoming Diana. Royal salute! However, Diana had publicly doubted Charles's suitability for kingship. She believed he was born to the wrong job, but could he cope as the king without a wife? It is important to have the support of somebody that you can trust and you can totally trust, just as the Queen has the Duke of Edinburgh. I wonder how she could carry on if he didn't exist. It is the real top of the greasy pole and you're there on your own. And so you must have somebody to give you some support, somebody you can confide your hopes and fears, dreams, etc. to. The prospect of a Queen Camilla may still be unwelcome, but would Charles really want to make her his wife after Diana's tragedy? The real argument is that there's going to be 20 or 25 years yet before Charles becomes king. If marriage to Camilla courted a great wave of public antipathy and dislike, as I think it probably would, that would die away in three or four or five years, and he'd still have another 20 years. So I think a lot of people, the public opinion seems to be swinging around to why not, now that Diana's gone, give those boys a mother, etc. Whether or not the British people want Camilla, the woman that broke up the marriage as the ideal stepmother for William and Harry is a different matter. I suspect that Charles in the end will prefer the status quo where he has a virtual wife in Camilla who spends several nights a month with him at St James's Palace and virtually lives with him at Highgrove in Gloucestershire where she has a house in the grounds and that they'll never actually marry but she'll be virtual wife virtual queen. That decision may lie in the future. For now, Charles's immediate role is to raise his sons to maturity without the mother they lost so young. <laughs> <laughs>